Hello, welcome back. Today we are going to talk about gold. So this stuff behind me, uh, usually quite valuable. So we'll talk about the price of gold over time. And this will be a video about modeling price. So gold is a good one. Uh, it tends to have a low inflation rate. So it will be a good opportunity for us to study price of something that we think should grow exponentially. Okay, so I'll get rid of this, minimize it, and we'll be on to the topic. So this will be a Mathematica tutorial. It will take us into least squares data fitting. And so for this exercise, I should uh, minimize the size of myself. So just bear with me. Not that. Uh, right, so I might just have to work that out later okay anyway so I'll try to move my head when necessary okay so we will open up a new Mathematica notebook put it over here and first of all we will increase the magnification to 300 so we can see all right and I'll have to do that up in the corner because I haven't worked out how to make my head smaller all right so first of all we'll enter this comment what we're doing is we're modeling the price of gold in US dollars since 1973. Well, why 1973? Uh, because that's when Mathematica is able to gather data um, on, on the price of gold, okay, from that point. Now, we all know that um, Nixon took the US dollar off of, off of being essentially backed by gold in 1971. So, this is the price of gold after that. All right, so um, I've entered a comment now. What I'll do, so I'm gonna copy and paste a lot of things because that'll make this quicker and hopefully you don't get too bored. Okay, so now there's a command in Mathematica called financial data. This is a built-in function that accesses the internet um, for the prices of various things. For example, Apple stock. So we all know that um, Apple stock prices took a, a hit recently. And apparently Warren Buffett lost a bit of money. Okay, so you can access that with this. Now, the first time you press shift enter, it will take a little while to, I'll do it now and I'll keep talking. So it'll take a little while to uh, get onto the internet Okay, apparently I already had it uh, done, but when you do this for the first time with Mathematica, it will take a little while to to run because it's got to communicate with um, the database on this stuff, right? And and this will be recent, the last day. Okay, so what I've done is I've 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 entered this into memory now. So there's there's a list, and let's see, just to show you what some of this looks like, let's go take s and we'll take out the first five uh, elements of this list. Okay, shift enter. Uh, whoops, I've got to <laughs> re-enter that again. So you might want to put this in a new cell next time you do it. So it doesn't take a while to, to run the initial code. Okay, so we can see what the first five elements of this list look like. Now they are, we've got dates. So here you can see the year 1973. And then we have, I believe that should be January. Uh, the first month of the year and this is the fourth so we, we're we're talking about the 4th of January 1973 and apparently the price was sixty four dollars and ninety cents US dollars now nowadays the price is pretty expensive right so uh, I think it's like twelve hundred US dollars now all right so you can see it's gone up right now attribute that uh, price increase to what you like but it's gone up Okay, so now that we know how to see what the data looks like, what we want to do is translate um, these dates into Julian days, all right? So that, because look, I mean, you look at this and you see, okay, so we've got the fourth, we've got the fifth, and then it jumps to the eighth, all right? So if you're doing some uh, price modeling, it's a bit annoying that there are gaps in it, okay? So um, you want to translate the dates to something, um, like like Julian days, days from what we would call the beginning of time or recorded um, 
civilization, all right, which is back 4,700 or so years BC. All right, so Julian days counts counts the uh, the days from what we would call the beginning of history. All right, so next I'm going to talk about that. Now, in a previous video in which I talked about Bitcoin, uh, I accessed a website to get the Julian dates, but it's actually built into Mathematica, which is really convenient. <clears throat> All right, so Julian dates. Now, uh, let's see. First of all, you can, which I couldn't do on the website, you can translate from Julian dates to a date of the year, which is handy, right? Okay, so let's have a look. So here's a Julian day. And then let's translate this. Shift enter. Uh, whoops, I've done that again, putting all this other stuff um into memory again so I'll, I'll learn from that and i'll take this and put it in a new cell right now okay so come down here put this in a new cell so we don't have to uh, run all of that other code all right so you see what happens now this julian date is friday the 24th of april 2015 right? and it even even has a time right? because they have decimal points as well after these to um to give you the time of day even so it's a rather uh, handy system for measuring prices okay so and then let's um, I'll show you another command let's take the first the first uh, point of our data set s first okay and we can see what this is <clears throat> now we can do the same looking at the last one <clears throat> so the last one is uh, the 5th of January 2019, which is not too long ago. We're on, uh, in Australia, we're on in the 7th of January, so it must be the 6th of January in the USA. All right, so now, Julian days. How do I translate one of these dates into a Julian day? Okay, so I can just write a Julian date. So I do that one first, I pick a date. For example, the 4th of January 1973, and I go Julian date. So this will give me a Julian date. So first of all, let's do that so I can show you what comes out of that. And then I'll show you why I've applied another function to that. All right, so Julian date, 1973, and it's um, it gives me this, right? So what it gives me is 2.44 times 10 to the 6th, which is not really what I want, right? I don't want a scientific... Um, date. What I want is an integer, whole number. So uh, look, if you look at all of this, it comes with some decimal places. Okay, so what I want is to chop off the decimal places and give me an integer. Okay, so the floor function does exactly that. So that's why I'm using the floor function on this. Okay, so now that we know that, let's uh, convert all of the Julian days in our list of prices, price pairs, Let's convert them all into Julian dates. Okay, so next I'll comment what we're doing. Okay, so let's go down here. Uh, well, we'll just comment out a lot of these things. They're not going to take long to, to run. All right, and we'll say I'm doing uh, the conversion of dates to Julian days. And I've got JD for short. Okay, and then uh, to do that, because I want to generate a list, I will just use the table function, okay? So here you will see I've got exactly this command, right? To convert uh, the con convert to Julian day and then take the floor. So give me an integer. And then what I'm doing is I'm saying I want to do this with the jth element of this list, right? Where j is an arbitrary integer the jth element of this list and what i want to do then is pull out the first uh the first one of the jth element so this that's what this do does this is indexing very important i'm doing this on the jth element and the first one of that so this is actually the date okay and then after that i want to give me also the the price on that day all right and then i'm tabulating uh, as J goes through the number one up to the last entry, which will be the length of the length of S. Okay, so let's do that and see what we get. All right, I'll get the semicolon off and shift enter. 
Okay, now this will take a little while because there's much in that. There's quite a lot of data there. So we'll wait and we'll wait and we'll wait and we'll see what we end up with. Okay, here it is. Now what you see is you, you're shown the first two, which look okay, right? These are Julian days for 1973. And this is the one after that. And then the prices like those we expect. But then there's some dot, dot, dots, and it gives us the um, possibly the last one. Okay, but that's not exactly what we want, right? We want to see more of it. So let's put a semicolon on that. And let's just say take, uh, we've called that T. Okay, so take T5. Uh, right, okay, should have put that in a new cell. But this will show us the first five elements of that list. Okay, so now that we are content with um, the way the data is coming out, right now, remember, there's a gap in the day, but that's okay, because we're just seeing these as points, right? Points on a graph. All right, so now that we have that, uh, let's go down here to a new cell so that we don't have to run that calculation again. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is take the natural logarithm of the price because we suspect that this is going up exponentially. All right, so let's take the natural logarithm and so I'll call this set V. Okay, so what I have uh, copied and pasted here is basically this, except this time, I am taking the logarithm of the price, all right? Because it seems to be going up on average exponentially from 1973 to the present. Um, taking the logarithm would flatten that out. Okay, now that's a, that's a typical technique for um, making a price model is to take the log, right? And once you have the log, you want to um, find out what should be a good a good linear model on the log chart. All right, but let's have a look at this. Well, we'll enter it into memory at least. Okay, and then the next thing we want to do is plot both of these um, price charts, okay? So, so uh, let's call the first one as I have, let's call it, call it K. Come down here to a new cell. Uh, so this will be T once we've converted the gold prices to Julian days, so we have a pair of consisting of a day and a price. Okay. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll plot this. Okay, shift enter. Let's have a look. All right. Now this is, if you know anything about the gold price, this is what it has uh, looked like from 1973 to the present. All right. Now these are. Um, let's see if I can make this bigger without. Uh, putting that behind my head. So if you look at that, they're little points, okay? And, and you can't even see the gaps between the days and the weekends or whatever when the price wasn't recorded. Uh, well, you can't see that because there's just so many of these points, okay? But here is this. And now this is great because I'm not in something like TradingView, right? I mean, TradingView's got a lot of nice features like indicators that you can look at and so on, but... Here, I've got control of this data myself. It's in my computer, right? And now I can apply any mathematical technique that I like to this. Uh, and well, the point is, it's great to be in control of the data, right? You're responsible for what's going on. Okay, now that we've shown the, the price uh, over time, let's list plot uh, the logarithm of the price, okay? so. Now I've called A list plot V. Now remember V was the logarithm of the price. So let's do this too. Right, so here's the first one and then here's the second one and you can see this is flattened out. All right, it's increasing on the log chart. All right, but it looks like, yeah, we could maybe um, estimate what's going on by a line. Okay, now this is a common technique in science to, to do this when you have exponential growth take the log and then estimate this with a line. All right, now that brings me to the topic of uh, least squares, all right? Least squares, or you might know this as regression. So this is a technique, I think it might be due to Gauss, but go and look it up yourself. 
Uh, it's a technique for fitting a function to some data. Okay, now the simplest uh, model of of something is a line. Okay, so to to estimate what's going on here on this log chart uh, with a line, that's fairly simple to do. Okay, so let's briefly talk about least squares, and um, I guess so. This is sort of the topic of statistics and um, even optimization. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about what we'll do, and then we'll come back to calculating this on this chart. All right, so least uh, least squares, data fitting by least squares. So I'll just read a little bit from this book, Elementary Numerical Analysis by Atkinson. So Atkinson says, in scientific and engineering experiments, the measurement of physical quantities will generally be somewhat inaccurate. This may be due to human error, but more often due to limitations inherent in the equipment being used to make the measurements. All right, that's often the case, but we all know that prices fluctuate for whatever reason, right? Good news, bad news, uh, changes in um, economic policy. I mean, especially uh, with gold, because gold is considered to be a hedge against um, against the stock market and so on, right? When the, When stocks are doing bad, gold tends to do well. Okay, so let's see. So we've got some data, right? Now our data looks something like this. It's a a list of pairs. So I'll have to put this up here so we can see this and and my big head. All right, so we wish to fit the the points as in the y points to a function f. Now in our case this is going to be just a simple line. So this is easy. All right, so we do not expect to find all of these y's on the function that we're interested in, right? Because there's going to be a little bit of noise, like the ups and downs in the price of gold. So what we do is we say, let epsilon j be the difference between the function and the y values. Okay, so these are the errors in each measurement. All right, I won't read that. Let's go down and here's an example of a data set. All right, and this, Here's the um, picture of that. Now it looks like we could fit this to a line. Okay, so let's scroll down. All right, so we suggest the model y equals mx plus b. All right, so we are seeking the constants m and b, as in the slope and the uh, what you would call the y-intercept b. All right, we assume that the error epsilon j is yj minus m times xj minus b. So in other words, the y points minus our model, which in this case is this line. Okay, and we assume that it's uh, randomly distributed. I better say this right. Random variable normally distributed and has a mean, um, has this mean here. Okay, so this is the normal error assumption. And we seek to find uh, a function f, right? In other words, in, in our case, since this is about a line, we seek to find the m and the b, right? But uh, we seek to find it such that we uh, minimize this square root of, of the sum of squares. Okay, so what we've got is we've got our line, and we've got points uh, above or below the line, and we're measuring distances to the line, okay? You see, so we want those distances to be minimized. We want to uh, construct our line such that all of those distances to the line are least, okay? And so we do that with this formula. This is nothing but, um, well, it's it's basically uh, Pythagoras' theorem. All right, but in, in a higher number of dimensions. This is not just a squared plus b squared equals c squared, but a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared equals, you know, the what the higher dimensional hypotenuse would be, something like that. Okay, so we're seeking to minimize this. Now this is minimized when the sum of these squares are minimized. Okay, so we make that observation. So now we just have to minimize this uh, sum right here. Right, again, these are the y values in our list. 
um, and the, the the function or the model of the x value. So these are these are linear right here. Okay, so um, let's see what is this right here. So this is just substituting in uh, y equals mx plus b right in there. Okay, so this is the same thing. So we want to minimize this. Now the xj and the yj, these are known points because we've got a big data list. Okay, what is unknown are just the two letters m and b. Okay, so now what you do is if you are trying to, now this is a surface, right? Because we've got an m and a b, these are variables. And then we've got the f value, which is like on the z axis. So, so, uh, M, B, Z, all right? So there's a surface there. There's a surface, and we want to find the bottom of this surface, essentially. All right, so using um, that, so that brings us into the technique of optimization or, or finding minima. Okay, now, uh, if you know something about calculus, you can do so with what we call the gradient. Uh, the gradient, so grad F, right? So we want to take partial derivatives uh, so this is a partial derivative with respect to m, partial derivative with respect to v, and when those partial derivatives are both zero, right, we have found a local uh, minima, right? So that's what we're seeking, a local minima in this case. Now this is nothing more than a quadratic surface, so there should only be one of these in this case. Okay, so we take grad f. Now we can do this in Mathematica symbolically by well, all of this code, but I'm not going to talk a lot about that. I want to talk to you about the ge geometry of this. So we're finding a minima here, the bottom. Actually, I can't touch the screen, can I? Okay, so there's a. you can imagine there's a bottom along this, and then you can't see much along here, but there's also a, a bit of curving along this direction as well, where my mouse is going. All right, there's a bottom, it's just not too visible. Okay, so we're seeking a bottom of this. Now, um, it's minimized, this function is minimized when grad f is zero. So we take a partial derivative, all right? Now these are hand calculations here. Take a partial derivative with respect to b. Okay, so we can, by the rules of partial differentiation, move this operator inside the sum. Okay, so that's what we do first, move the operator inside the sum. And we differentiate that. Now to do so, to differentiate this with respect to b, we need to use the chain rule, right? Because we have a function of a function, so there's a square there. All right, so since we're doing that, we bring the two down, which is right there, times this. It's like the derivative of x squared is two x. Okay, so that's this part. And then by the chain rule, we have to differentiate the function inside. So we differentiate this with respect to b, and of course, this goes to zero, this goes to zero, and this is just one. Okay, so what we find is that um, this derivative is zero when twice the sum, because we can pull the two outside. Uh, we can factorize it outside this bracket and put it in front of the sum. So twice the sum equals zero. All right, so that's that. Now, the same thing for the derivative, partial derivative of this function with respect to m. Okay, but we do the same thing, use the chain rule and so on, and we find for that one twice the sum of m x j squared plus b x j minus x j times y j equals zero. Okay, so we've got two of those. Now that's grad f equals zero, right? Which should tell us um, when we've reached the bottom of our surface. All right, so. Um, okay, so I need to move this a little bit this way. Okay, so we have this equals zero, and now that implies, um, because we can rearrange this equation, it implies mb plus m times the sum of the xj is equal to the sum of the yj. And now the second equation that we derived, m times the sum of the xj plus m times the sum of the squares of the xj is equal to the sum of the products of the x and the y. Okay, now that we have these, we have written this system of equations in such a way that we have the m, the b, the m, and the b right here on the left-hand side. All right, that's what we want to do because in the end we want to solve for the m and the b. 
Okay, so next we write this as a matrix equation to just clarify what we have. All right, and when we do that, what we have in our matrix, remember when you multiply this matrix times this vector, you get exactly all this stuff right here. Okay, so as a matrix equation, that system is simply this, this matrix equation. Now I have to move this so that you can see. Okay, so here we have all of this. Now, if the determinant of this matrix on the left-hand side is non-zero, then there's a unique solution to uh, the system for M and B. Okay, and now you can express that in this way too. All right, so basically what we want to do in order to find the M and the B so that we can do this uh, least squares fitting is we just have to solve this, all right? So we calculate the sum of the X, the sum of the X squared, the sum of the Y, the sum of the XY. That's enough, right? So N is just the length of the, the list. And then we solve that. Okay, and we get M and B, and we, and we then get our uh, linear model. All right, so now that we have seen that, let's go back to calculating. All right, so here's what we have. So again, we're just fitting uh, a line to this, to the gold price on the log chart. All right, so let's go down there, and then I'll copy in some more code. So next we want to find, uh, we want to know the length of the list V. All right, so we have uh, 12,957 data points on the price of gold in, in memory. All right, and now let's say what we're doing. Next we are constructing that two by two matrix that I just talked about uh, right here, right here. All right, I'm going to construct that. Now, when you enter a matrix in Mathematica, the easiest way to do it, I guess, when you are um, doing some programming is to enter it as a list of lists. Okay, but you can, then, um, you can then visualize it, and I'll show you that in a second. But first, let's construct the matrix that we're talking about. All right, so the top left entry is the N, all right? And then what I have is the sum of the vj, the first component, which is just xj, as j goes from 1 to n. Now what I'm talking about here in this, in this entry is nothing more than this one right here that I'm circling with the mouse. All right, now notice the same one goes down here. So that's the same entry of the matrix. All right, so that is right here. And then the last entry of the matrix, the bottom right, is the sum of the squares. All right, so that I have entered here. So, so notice I have V, J, 1, and then I've squared it with this, right? But I'm summing over all that. Okay, so this is the matrix. Now let's put that in memory, and then I'll show you how to view that as a matrix. You just write matrix form, M, shift enter, and you can see what you have. Now these are integers, okay? So, so they're not they're not approximations; they're integers. Um, so, so there should be basically no error when we take the inverse of this matrix and use that to solve uh, for M and B. Okay, so that's the the next thing we want to do after entering the right hand side of this equation, which is this vector right here, uh, involving sums of y's and some sum of x times y. All right, so let's do that too, and I'll call that uppercase B. All right, so let's put that there. Okay, so that's now in memory. And now let's say that we want to solve. I want to solve for B and M, or M and B. And um, to do that, I can simply take the inverse of the matrix M and multiply that by the vector B. Right, and that should give me uh, that should give me. Let's see the pair BM. Okay, so that should give the pair BM. All right. So now, what do we get? Let's have a look at what we have. We have minus uh, two nine three point something, and then uh, our our uh, our slope B. Uh, sorry, our slope M. Is, is a number that is 
closer to zero than it is to one. Okay, so so on the log chart, this this is um, because there's so many days. I know it looks like it's going up on the chart, but there's so many days in that list that this gradient is is pretty much flat. Okay, so now that we have those numbers, let's use them. All right, so I've already got this down, so I'm going to say that I'm I'm plotting plotting both of these. All right, so plot both. Now, the first thing that I'm plotting is the line itself. Okay, so the line. Now, notice I've taken this, chopped off some decimal places. I put it right here next to t all right so this is the line y equals mx plus b right but the the horizontal axis is time okay so t t for time all right now i want to plot that line uh over the julian days two four four one six eight six so that was back in 1973 and then this one is the present Okay, so now I'm also showing the the log chart, which I had called earlier. I called that A right up here, the log chart. All right, so this one. Show that together with the line. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Shift enter. All right, beautiful, beautiful, you beauty. Okay, so what we see now is the log chart of that of the gold prices. And now we have the line that we found by least squares data fitting together on the um, price of gold chart. Okay, so that's good. Now that we have that, we have a model for this roughly. I mean, there are lots of fluctuations in this, right? But we have a basic model for the gold price. Okay, so what we can do with this now is um, take this back, right? We realize that what we've got is, this is a, a line on the log chart. So what we wanna do is, is convert this model into, an exponential curve. Okay, so let's go back and do that. Well, really, I'm just going to show you the plot so that, so that you can believe that it makes sense. Okay, so this says plot the model with the gold price. Okay, so what you see here is I've simply copied this right here, put it inside this exponential function. So this says e to the power of this. Okay, e to the power of that, right? Because I took a natural log of that price data in the first place. And so now I want to say, well, this is the most basic model that I have of the price of gold over time. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So we're going to show the gold chart together with this one that we're just constructing. We're constructing a plot of that, of that exponential function. Okay, shift enter, let's see. Okay, so oh, beautiful, beautiful. Look at this. So this is a really basic model for the price of gold from 1973 to the present. Okay, now look, I mean, that was clearly in a bit of a bubble uh, sometime in the recent past. Okay, so maybe maybe you might uh, find a way to adjust this model like you might construct an exponential curve that goes up through there maybe if you think that that's more reasonable and to do that you might chop off some of the recent lower data okay or you might say well look this could dip under this exponential curve right that's possible but um i mean one thing to consider if you're thinking about this carefully uh, for making money is that uh, for the last say 10 or 12 years the the price of the Dow Jones the S&P 500 etc those have been rising and rising and rising we've had a bull market for the last um, 10 or dozen years so that's probably going to end one day right is it now I don't know I don't know this is not investment advice this is just a discussion of price modeling Okay, so uh, that's about all I have for you. Now, let's see, I have one more uh, note here. List of pay. Oh, okay, so the next thing you could do, all right, is this. I'll show you this last piece of code. Uh, let's see, okay, good. I think it's what I want. 
All right, so this says list of pairs containing the day and the difference. So price minus the model. Okay, so why would you want this, right? So this is basically, okay, consider that bubble end on the price of gold. Um, and I, I reckon this is just after the, the, the global financial crisis of 2007 and eight. Um, that, that gold, I mean, just looking about where, where that is, gold went up after that, right? So I think initially gold went down with it. So so maybe the GFC happened around this point. Don't know, and I'm not going to check now. Uh, but then later gold went up, I guess because people were afraid, right? Uh, okay, so what is this? This is the difference in the price. So, so why you might want to take the difference between this exponential model and the price is so that you can, um, do some some other kind of analysis on the price of something okay like let's talk about something seasonal like uh what is what is a seasonal fruit i mean nowadays this maybe doesn't matter so much because um we're in a wide world where you can buy fruit from south america or somewhere tropical when you're having winter and vice versa right so Maybe this is not so relevant, but consider that um, some things some things have prices that are naturally seasonal. So if that is indeed the case, then you might be able to measure that using a technique known as um, Fourier transformations, Fourier analysis, signal processing. Uh, yeah, things in that category. So signal processing allows you to fit uh, a sum of periodic functions it allows you to separate those to separate those so if I have a sum of say two sine waves and I want to identify uh, what that sum is it's a sum of this frequency plus this frequency for example Fourier uh, analysis or the discrete Fourier transform and the fast version of that that will allow you to separate those frequencies and and actually see um, see that periodic nature to separate signal from noise and to throw away the noise. There are all kinds of fascinating techniques that you can apply to such data when you do that, but that will be a topic for another video. Okay, so I'll just um, execute this so we can see this plot. Okay, so so here I'm just plotting the the difference between the peaks and uh, the troughs and the actual model itself. Okay, so that's what I've done there. I've just plotted that. But given that I'm able to plot that, I also have that data in memory, and I could then apply some um, signal processing to this and, and try to model this right here with a sum of periodic functions. All right now, some people would say that that's a dangerous thing to do, and that might be part of the problem in um, booms and busts okay so you don't want to take mathematics too seriously but sometimes it can be helpful all right so that's all for now i hope you got something from that and uh please like subscribe and comment thank you